I'm Scott Allen Miller. This is Sam IT, and today I want to talk about the economic factors and the market problems with approaching no-code and low-code solutions. So first of all, let's start by defining what these are. Traditionally, if you need to make software, you have to have a developer who's going to write code, and that is going to be the basis of your application. And we all know that developers are expensive and designing software is difficult. The idea with no-code and low-code solutions is that we will have a piece of software or a tool that allows us to simply, for example, drag and drop components onto a screen and create an application, eliminating the need for developers. And this idea is fantastic, and it has been around a long time. Of course, eliminating developers as part of the equation has a lot of benefits. They're expensive, they're complicated, needing to manage them is hard, finding the right one is hard, and so forth. The dream is that we can simply open up an application, drag a few things onto the screen, and suddenly replace our developers with a few clicks of the mouse. Reality, however, is very different, and that's what we want to look at. First of all, let's look at history. History says we've had low and no-code solutions for a really long time. Some of the earliest tools for this that you're familiar with will include things like Microsoft Access and Visual Basic. Both of these tools attempted to take large portions of the development process and make them graphical, and to some degree they did. Both are widely regarded as disasters as far as development goes, and their utility in business is very poor. While uh, access is generally seen as a pariah, Visual Basic is sometimes argued for as being marginally viable. And you can see my uh, videos about why Visual Basic is the worst programming language. Uh, but this and others like it, like Delphi, uh, did have a moment when they were relatively popular, mostly at the dawn of the GUI era. And uh, they proved to be very expensive to support and highly problematic, completely counterintuitive to what you would think and end up in instead of saving money, they ended up being cost centers compared to more advanced and more serious programming languages for a lot of reasons. One being they didn't attract the best developers, they attracted marginal developers. And that's going to be something we're going to see with no code as well. So uh, we've already seen for decades an attempt to do this with really serious failures. Visual Basic didn't fail as badly as Access because it was it was more of a low code solution, whereas Access was a no code solution. And the farther you get from having developers with those skills, the more difficult the problem is going to be. So let's start with that. What is the difficult problem? Regardless of whether or not you are writing code or just dragging and dropping, designing software is hard. There's a lot of things you have to consider. And we spend an awful lot of time when we're designing code, talking to users and figuring out what they actually need, bringing a lot of industry knowledge about ways to approach things, um, ways to, to deal with data, putting all that together, and then the assembly of all that. That's something that requires a lot of expertise in a lot of different areas. And even when we have developers, a lot of that process is not done by a single developer, we have a lot of different expertises we need to bring into that. If we move to a no-code solution, we do away with all of those levels of expertise and we take the person who would normally hire those people and expect them to do the process instead. If we don't, then we're bringing in the experts who don't need the no-code solution. And there's a reason why developers don't want to work with those kinds of things. They aren't very practical. They're not efficient for most things that developers do. Once in a while, they can be beneficial. And as someone who has used Access and Visual Basic, there are certainly times that sitting down with Visual Basic and being able to put together simple button press screens and different components graphically can be beneficial to moving quickly especially when showing things to customers. But when it comes to actually making applications that work, those things do very little to make it easier. And if the rest of the framework is not there to support those graphical elements, it can easily make it worse. And so it proved to be something that did not have the benefits that people were expecting and it did exactly the opposite in most cases. So doing away with your specialized developers or giving them tools that are not good for their job is not a great way to make people efficient. Let's compare it to architecture. Yes, it is theoretically possible that we could build a computer AI that is going to take our inputs about how we want a building to be and, and construct something or design something that is completely feasible. And eventually, in both cases, there's the very real possibility, the expected possibility, that buildings and software will be better designed by AI than it will be by humans. That's 
a given. I think we all pretty much accept that. But today, we're not talking about AIs of that level. And in most of these cases, we're not talking about AIs at all. We're talking about simplistic tools that allow you to put things together, regardless of whether or not they make sense. So if we were looking at an architectural application, it would basically guarantee that your girders and your walls joined up correctly, but allow you to just drag and drop and put anything you want anywhere you want and has no way to enforce that you're doing a good job. You would almost guaranteed to become up with something incredibly sloppy that didn't take into account all those specialty things about interior space and flow and comfort and entrance and exit and fire codes that are done by architects. They spend years learning how to design buildings well, not just how to make them technically function. And the same thing with developers. If you're doing away with people who are trained to understand end user needs, who are trained to understand how data interacts, who are trained to create applications that flow well and make sense, if you do away with all of that and take a tool that those people wouldn't want to use and give it to someone who doesn't have those skills and training, the chances that using a tool that the, the trained professionals don't want to use is going to make someone who isn't trained able to make something they would like is not, a, is not a good opportunity for that. This is a bad process overall. But theoretically, if you could make a tool that really gave all the options, that gave all the power to someone to do that, then yes, in theory, if they were motivated to do so and had the time to do so, they could perhaps make something useful. And no code has some applications and probably in the future, as it gets better, it will start to have some applicability. Today, however, that is very difficult. The solutions that are out there are very simplistic and mostly function on really basic graphical interfaces and take very little into account on the back end, the place where most of the hard work is being done. And so they tend to look like there might be really useful to end users who don't realize that the heavy lifting is not there and they don't have the people who understand what that is. They also tend to ignore the needs of operations. In the real world, developers who are doing their job are gonna spend a lot of time working with the operations team who will help design the overall product. They understand the needs of running it in production, not just the needs of creating it. Those teams need to work together. And yes, a lot of companies eschew this and that is a huge problem and loses tons of money and causes all kinds of risk. But any competent development process you cannot even make the claim that you're attempting to do a good job if the developers are not working with the production teams to design how the system will work at the end of the day. They must work in concert or they are skipping their fundamental requirements. I can't overstress that. Average companies, will, especially those who are outsourcing, will go to developers and do what we call throwing over the wall. They throw over some requirements and they get some code back. The team on the other side of that wall has no reason to try to do a good job because no good job has been requested of them. The IT team who needs to use that code eventually is never brought in until it's too late, if at all. And only then do they say, why have such crazy things been done? We can't run this code, or it's gonna cost us a fortune to run this code, or no consideration for production was taking into account. Why? Because the developers were engaged in such a way that they were completely kept away from production. The idea that the code would ever be used in production was probably hidden from them. They may have guessed, but it's not their job to guess. You need to inform them and work with them and have those requirements. And those requirements have come from your IT. There's no one else to give them. If you think you've given those requirements, you haven't talked into IT, you have not. You are mistaken. Okay. So that is lacking in no-code solutions as well. In theory, future no-code solutions may have some way to deal with that. Currently, they really do not. So it's, it's not a fundamental problem with no-code as a theory. It is a problem with the practicality of no-code in the current environment. Now, market pressures. This is really important. And we, we talk about this from time to time, understanding market pressures. In order to fund no-code solutions, you generally need a lot of financing. Developers don't tend to want to work on no-code solutions because the concept is writing code that in theory proves that developers are pointless. That's not something that's easy to convince developers to do, whether you feel it is true or not. It doesn't make it that developers are going to want to invest their time doing that. And so that creates a, a tendency to not do so.
When they do, it tends to be pretty simplistic. There are open source solutions out there that allow you to do um, low code, but they tend to be extremely rudimentary, uh, at least today. And in many cases, what people call no code is not even a no code replacement. It's just a general tool for looking at databases or CRUD or something similar, something that we wouldn't classify as uh, uh, really coding. It's more of just producing starting, starting boilerplate and again, we have tools for that in development. We don't need no code solutions to do that, even graphical ones. That's just a click away in many environments and it's not considered no code by developers. It's considered boilerplate. That's different. It is technically no code in that incredibly basic way, but people who are talking about no code are often overlooking that in order to look at no code, they're basically saying that they're willing to make do with the level of applications that you could get simply by asking your development team to give you a boilerplate. They could have it in a few minutes without the no code solutions, but with the flexibility of the development team using their standard boilerplate and tool selection and flexibility so that you would avoid a lot of the problems that will come with no code. Those open source solutions that you can run yourself, very few and far between, very rudimentary, not worth really discussing at this point. Someday in the future, I'm sure a good one will come out. That will make for a different discussion point, but at this time, it is not there. So the majority of no-code solutions are hosted, and they make their money by creating applications that you cannot escape. They basically create hosted SaaS as applications, software as a service applications uh, that run on their infrastructure. That means your data is in their database. You don't get to select the technology that is used. That makes sense. You don't get to select the hosting that's going to be used. You don't get to select the database that's going to be used. You don't get to select the database type that is going to be used. You use what they give you. And that generally means that your data is going to be locked away. And in every solution I've ever looked at, the cost of doing that is absurd. One that we looked at today, just as an example, but they are considered a major player in the market. They have a base price of $400 per month, and they give you 10 users with that. Each additional user is $25 per month. This may sound reasonable, but very few pieces of software cost this much, and those that do are generally considered uh, tools that have tricked end users, ones that have gotten management to buy in without really looking into long-term pricing and such. There are very few tools that reasonably can cost that amount of money per user um, without being highly, highly custom and specialized. And when we're looking at major line of business applications like SAP that do cost much more than that, there is no potential for something like that to be no code. The amount of development that goes into a product like that is so enormous. We are so far from no code, it is, it's not even in the realm of possibility. And so we're, when we're talking about no code, we're talking about extremely simple applications by nature. Like there's just no way around it. No code applications are the simplest possible applications. So when we're talking about $25 per user per month, we're talking about something that is um, outrageously out of the bounds of normal hosting. And to give an example, when a piece of software is created that is similar to what most no-code solutions are creating, hosting that may cost somewhere around $8 per month. You may have an IT team that needs to look over that, so maybe it's gonna be a little bit more, but figure it could be $50 per month. Maybe you're a really large organization, then those prices will go up. But if you're an organization that is exceptionally large and needs that to be more expensive to handle the number of users you have, for example, then the cost per user will keep going down. So if we're looking at a $50 solution for 50 users, which is reasonable, we're looking at $1 per user per month. If we went to 200 users and that had to go up to $100, which would actually be an outrageously large uh, expense for that, then you're only at 50 cents per user. Hosting will probably be far less than that in the real world. 20, if you have just a few users, yes, it's going to be difficult to get below a dollar per user if you only have 10 users. But if you have a thousand users, getting anywhere close to 25 cents per user may seem absurdly high. Uh, and if it doesn't seem absurdly high, then you need to be outsourcing your IT because that's all it's going to cost you going to a qualified outsourcer where you could be getting a lot of skills to do that hosting for you. Um, and you wouldn't, and including the actual hosting itself in most cases. So the, the, the prices that companies often think these things cost can be orders of magnitude out of line. And that may lead to things like no code seeming like a good idea. So when we're looking at some of these solutions, $25, if we were looking at a thousand users, they'd be looking at in excess of $25,000 per month to host that application. Keep in mind, we just said that maybe that would be $250 in actual IT cost. And in doing that, 
one of the biggest things we need to look at is not just the raw cost. Yes, $25,000 a month instead of $250 is crazy, but we also have to talk about risk. When we have our applications in that way, custom hosted by someone and we don't have access to it, how are we going to protect ourselves to get our data out of that potential database in a way that we could use it to recover in an emergency? We may not have that option. Of course, any given vendor may provide that option, but in general, it's not going to exist. And that's something we have to be really cognizant of because that is our biggest factor in looking at any of this is how will we pull out our data should anything go wrong? And if we're hosting it ourselves for that $8 or $250 or whatever, we have that data naturally in a way we can do anything we want with at any time. We don't have to have those kinds of panics like how are we going to extricate our data and put it into some alternative application sometime in the future. It is in a standard format that we control in a, in a format that we define, we can use it any way we want. It is not tra trapped inside of someone's uh, walled garden that we don't have access to. And that risk alone is generally enough to rule the majority of hosted no code solutions just out, period. It doesn't matter how much it costs. It doesn't matter how quick it is. It doesn't matter how easy it is. None of that matters. This risk is so significant, it should take it off the table right away that the cost is probably orders of magnitude too high should also be a really significant factor and make people question the sanity of looking at these solutions, but it's viable. The theory is that creating the software will be so much cheaper that that makes all the difference. And that's what we're gonna talk about next. The idea is that developers are really expensive and no code solutions are really cheap, at least up front. And this can make a lot of sense. If you're looking at, for example, the one that we were talking about that was $25 per user and be over $25,000 per month, 25,400 to be exact for a thousand person company, we are uh, talking about a development process that may only cost $400 a month to have that software during the time that development is happening. And then when it goes into production, we pay per user. That could make a lot of sense. How could we possibly have developers for $400 a month? Sensible. What is often missed, however, is that when we're talking about no-code solutions, we're talking about the most incredibly basic, simplistic software we could possibly imagine. We are not talking about things that are complex or require senior developers. When we talk about how expensive developers are, we're generally talking about very senior skilled developers, the kind you would want to use if you're on Wall Street or you were building a commercial application that you needed to have and you needed to have lots of flexibility, security, code validation, and lots and lots and lots of that experience that only comes with experience. The things where you need to understand, well, the users told me this, but I'm going to build something different because I know that isn't what they meant, right? Those kinds of things that make end users happy, those things that make software special, that makes it really performant, need high-end developers with a lot of skills. You don't think Microsoft Office is being developed by a no-code solution somewhere. There are a lot of senior developers with a lot of knowledge and experience and resources and training, and they're looking at that, trying to find ways to make it better or do something unique, and they're bringing a lot, a lot to the table. That's not something no-code is doing anytime soon. So if you want to produce something special, you're not going to be able to do it with no code. So what you are going to be able to make, this is important, what you can potentially make with no code only requires an extremely junior developer. And junior developers are really cost effective. And more importantly, you only need a little bit of a junior developer. So instead of looking at one of these solutions and saying, wow, I don't have $100,000 to throw at a developer, but I do have $400 to throw at this piece of software, we need to look at the total picture. What is the actual cost of making the kind of software we're talking about? In many cases, in the applications that I've seen, in the, in the examples that I've been shown, we're often looking at something that could have been made for several hundred dollars to maybe a few thousand dollars by an actual developer using tools that make sense that then allow for hosting of $16 a month kind of thing for even hundreds of users. That's very different very quickly. Even if that initial application costs $10,000, it's going to pay for itself in the first two weeks of deployment in that example case that we gave. Now in a smaller company where we're paying $400 a month for the hosting instead of $10 a month, yes, it may take two years before we recoup that $10,000. But in one case, we have a developer giving us that power and all that protection against growth. And in the other, we are locked into that $400 as long as we wanna use that, that tool. So after that two years, it's gonna get really expensive really quickly. And that developer may have done it a lot faster, may have done it a lot better, and may give us something 
that can be expanded later. We have the power to do things that we need in the future. And most importantly, if we need to get our data out of it, we can at any time. And if we need to shut it down, but need access to the data just in case, hosting costs can go to zero. Take a backup and spin it up if you need to. With normal software as a service based no code solutions, that's not an option. You're gonna keep paying for that data as long as you want access to it. So all these things really show how important it is to look at the big picture, even the lowest cost, the tiniest organizations. A 10-person organization looking at no-code solutions would realistically be out of their minds in all but the most fringe cases to even entertain it. The risk is so high, the cost is so high, and the, the power of getting a developer to do that is so easy. And for that kind of solution, it's you're really looking at someone who just needs to do it part time, someone who just needs to do a few hours. You're looking at a contract uh, job. It may be outsourced. It may be a nephew. It may be uh, a firm that does it. There's a lot. It may be in-house resources, but it's so cost effective. There's a reason why. And, and here's a great example. There is a reason why software houses don't use no code solutions, because if no code solutions made sense to people who understood how to make software, that's what they would do. When you have the people who have the resources to do it either way, when you have the people who make their money by making good decisions one way or the other, they are universally, with no exception I've ever heard of, choosing to write code. If they could turn out a product that made sense in any way whatsoever by not having the developers, by not paying those high salaries, by not having to design it, by just having their secretaries drag and drop things onto the screen, they would do so every single time because it would make them so much more money than what they are doing. And they would have so much more ability to scale up because it would be so much easier to find the people to do it. It would still be potentially difficult, but not difficult like finding skilled developers. And so that they don't do it, that IT firms would never do this, right? For the same reason, IT firms would never touch Microsoft Access unless they were an access reseller and doing it so that they could say, we used it right? It would be crazy to use Microsoft Access as if you had any IT or development training. You would not do so. You know it's crazy. You would not use Visual Basic if you knew how to not use it, right? Because that is, they don't have upsides. They only have downsides. So those who are in the know are avoiding them for a reason. And we shouldn't think that by being out of the know, and this is a common thing. We see this in both IT and development. Management and CEOs and, and company owners and investors have a certain tendency to think that the information, the, the industrial knowledge, that, that uh, tribal knowledge held by specialists, by the IT specialist, by the development specialist, by the engineering specialist, they think that that knowledge somehow doesn't apply to them if they don't use those resources. They think that there's some secret way or special way to skip all of the hard work, all of the special knowledge, all of the things that those people would never skip, that they can just skip it and everything will be fine and they will save money and they will uh, you know, get exactly the same results or nearly the same results without doing all that work. There is a reason why those people, when they own their own firms, do that work. And it's because they know that's how they get their cost savings, their data protection. That's how they protect their own companies. That's how they make their money. It's, it's, it's pretty significant hubris to think that you can skip that expertise and work from the answers they never come up with. It's one thing to think you can skip their expertise because you think you know what answer they would have come up with. Well, every developer I talked to gave me this answer, so I think I can go with that answer without hiring a developer to do it probably still a bad idea, but at least you are going from a, this is what they would do, so I will do the same thing. I'm hoping I can get good enough results. But saying they would never do this with all their knowledge and expertise and experience, they think this is crazy, but I think somehow without having their expertise, I'm gonna get better results than they can without having anybody with that expertise doesn't make any sense. And yet company after company after company thinks that they're gonna get away without having to do the heavy lifting and that it will just be magically provided for them and the results are universally terrible. Now, of course, companies that do it aren't gonna tell you how terrible it is because like any project that fails, they are embarrassed, they have their jobs on the line, no manager wants to say, this made no sense and I did it anyway and I cost our company all kinds of money and now we're trapped with it. It's a great way to get fired. 
No CEO wants to admit to his investors that he did something that was completely crazy and any amount of, amount of business analysis should have told him to absolutely take it off the table. He's not going to say that. So if you go talk to companies that use no code, they will tell you, oh no, it works fine for us. That's the famous quote. It works for us is another way of announcing that a project has failed miserably but they aren't willing to actually say the words. If they felt that it actually made sense, they would tell you that it did so. They would say, it saved us money versus a developer. They would say, here's the total cost of hosting and IT and software engineering and design that we estimated in both cases and how no code saved us money. No one is ever gonna say that. They're gonna say things like it worked for us and ignore the total cost of ownership. They will completely never mention the IT cost so that they can hide that because that's part of what's going on with no code. It's taking the development cost and shifting it into IT to hide it. This is common across IT. You'll see IT companies do this all the time. They wanna make their IT solutions look cheap. They'll take the IT money and they'll shift it into hardware purchases. They'll make you buy a whole bunch of hardware you don't need because that covers up that that's paying for the IT people to do the work. So you look at your line item for IT and you say, oh, it was really cheap. It wasn't. It was shifted over here. It's actually a form of money laundering just within your organization, not hiding it from the government, hiding it from the investors. That's all that's going on. And that's what a lot of these companies will do. They'll hide it in their IT cost so that they don't have to admit that they lost in the overall development space because it's one bill and they just moved the money around and lost a lot overall. And they won't tell you when they're trapped partially because that puts their company at risk. That's not something you want to expose. And again, because you're embarrassed. So going to companies and asking how this works, got to be realistic. Look at what's behind the scenes. They're always going to tell you that it worked well because it's the, the decision that they made. If you want to get good results in making software, hire developers. Find a good developer relationship. It is not that hard. It does take some time. You do want to have those resources, but you want those resources. And once you have them, doing things like no code is going to save you a lot. And here's the last piece. When we're doing no code, we have to count the total number of people that are doing the job. So if we're, and we find this in other things like telephony, I'll give that example in a second. So when you're doing a no code solution, let's say you're going to build a very simple book tracking application for your bookstore. You don't want to hire a developer, so you have someone who works in the bookstore do it instead. Now you have a person who is acting as the developer, but is not trained as a developer. That's fine. In theory, they have this no-code solution that takes all the development knowledge out of their hands. They don't need to know what they're doing. They can just drag things around on the screen, and it should do as well as someone who's a trained interface designer who understands color and button placement and workflows and all that stuff. Okay, let's say that they're able to do that. In theory, you now have one resource building that software. They now know how that software is made. They are the, the masters of that software and you're, you're paying a person to do that. Now let's go look at the development process. If we needed to hire a developer to make that application, we would have to hire a developer. So now we have the cost of a non-developer and the cost of a developer, one employee in both cases. Presumably, the developer is more expensive than the non-developer. That may or may not be true. It may be that they are much more expensive. It is hard to say, but it's important to know. In both cases, we have to hire someone to do it. Somebody's hours have to go into making this product. Now, in many cases, learning the no-code solution doesn't save time because the developer already knows their programming. They're already trained. So they may be, able, may be able to make a basic book tra tracking application before this user even figures out how to log in and look at their no-code solution. That's important. The untrained person may have more barrier to even getting started than the developer has to making the solution. But let's assume that that is not the case. Let's assume that they're both able to get in and they take similar amounts of time to make the application. Unlikely, because remember, if the developer felt that this way was as fast, they would do it. They're not doing it because they're more efficient some other way using standard enterprise tools. Those tools are also free in all but the, the weirdest of cases. So you assume development resources are simply free. Your IDEs, your programming languages, your compilers, your hosting environments, everything professional is free by and large. There's no reason to be entertaining anything that isn't free. If your developers are telling you they need non-free things, get new developers for real. If your IT hosting environment says, well, we need these expensive hosting things, someone needed to step in and make sure that didn't happen. There's no reasonable excuse for a situation where we're having a discussion about no code as an option, where cost of anything should be coming up. Someone is slipping in extra cost for some reason somewhere. That's not a real part of the equation. So fix that before you look at your numbers. 
So with the no-code solution, we assume then going forward, we've paid probably more or at least equal for the resource to make the application. We didn't save money. That was a trick. We say, well, how much did you spend on a developer? They don't ask how much did you spend on humans, right? They'll be like, well, you already employed this person. Sure, but they were doing that instead of something else, right? The developer could be brought on just to do this, right? So they don't take away from your business. Presumably you have staff because they have jobs to do already. You don't want them doing something new they're not trained to do or specialized in. Maybe they're really interested in it. Maybe it's you working for yourself and your board Okay, there's a there's a certain argument to be made for that, but not a good one in most cases because this is your data and it's generally something that you don't want to put in danger just because you're bored and want to save a couple dollars. But let's assume that there are costs about the same. So you didn't save money building with no code. Now you have to host it. In this case, you should have had a developer who's doing a good job, talk to your IT people, and the hosting is going to cost nothing. The future is going to cost nothing. This is really super, super cheap. We're talking about a very basic application here, but that's all you can reasonably approach with no code. The no code person now has to go to whatever no code application they did. And if it was maybe they used an open source one, they have to host it. However, that requires it's probably not a big deal, but not as simple as using the standards. But almost certainly they're going to be using some online tool that now has a great expense because that was the point is getting you locked in. So now they can charge you the great expense of hosting it. And every product we've ever looked at, that's where they make their money is that lock in that you're trapped with for forever. So now maybe it's a tiny bookstore and you're only paying $100 a month to have that hosted. But the alternative was eight. So in this case, you probably paid more to develop the application. It probably took longer and it probably doesn't work as well as this one, which would have been faster cheaper, more secure, your data is protected, and every month from now on, you're going to be saving money. That's the real world uh, view. And it's one that's very easy to make seem not true. It's an easy sales tactic to fool people into thinking that that savings isn't there. But when you actually break down who has to do the work, how much they're going to cost, how long they're going to take, chances are the developer is actually the cost savings in most cases. Now, the final thing I want to use as an example is phones. I work for a phone company, and one of the things we find a lot, we bundle our support with the phones, all of the support. You need help with absolutely anything. I just need to change this number. I need to upload a new voice message. I need to set us away for the afternoon because we left early. All of that's included. You don't have to have someone who learns how to use the phone system. Most of our competitors don't provide anything like that, but they say they have support. When they're price comparing between vendors, Yes, we're generally cheaper, but only by a tiny bit. And people say, oh, it's only a tiny bit cheaper. I'm still with this company or whatever. But what they miss is they then hire us or some other IT firm to be able to support that product. Or in cases where they don't, they have an internal staff member that they task with being a phone IT person. And they spend a lot of their time learning and managing phones, often something that makes them very unhappy because it's not what they like to do. So they have to provide all the support themselves and they conveniently leave that out of their general calculations of cost. When we've had customers that have us do the in-house phone management, what we've found is that it roughly doubles the cost of the phones. Half of the cost of the phone systems is in the support of those phone systems long term that nobody calculates ever. They just ignore it. And when they pay the bill, they just write it off as IT. They don't pay attention to the fact that it's part of the cost of using that phone system. And if they were with a different phone system that included support, that would be included. And so that's often overlooked. And the same thing is happening here with no code. Yes, the no code seems like it's not that much more expensive until you realize all of the ongoing support costs that nobody calculates because they think of it as an IT cost rather than part of the cost of the solution or a cost generated by the solution lacking something key. And so in no case am I aware of a no-code solution that even comes into the ballpark of being effective to use in the real world. It just doesn't make sense. Be interested in hearing people's experience where they think they've used no code that it actually saved money or at least broke even uh, because I am not aware of those cases. The problem is most people will quote outrageously overpriced development and say, well, we need a $200,000 a year developer and they did a minimum of six months and that would have cost uh, $50,000. So there's no way, um, no way it could have been that uh, cheap um, the no code has to be has to be the more cost effective solution. Yes, if those numbers were true, but those numbers are not true. If you could do it with no code, you could have done it with a really, really inexpensive uh, development resource. Um, and and all of those those numbers are meaningless.
right? That is often how people approach it after the fact is giving uh, false calculations of what is required of the of the development solution to make it sound like it would be expensive. And we often say, if you're looking at building bespoke software in a company, you need to start be you need to be thinking in million dollar budget ranges, not not five thousand dollars. But if you're looking at the kind of bespoke software you could make with no code, you need to be thinking more in the five thousand dollar range. This is a different type of software. This isn't the kind of thing we normally discuss in those kinds of terms as bespoke software. This is a very 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 inexpensive thing to make well. Thanks for joining me. Please remember to like and subscribe. Get those comments below. I want to hear your experiences with this, your concerns with no code, with development. What have you found? How do you think that this benefits? Um, of course, there are lots of bad developers out there. People do see no code as a potential to escape from that. That's viable, um, but I think it carries a lot of risks that people don't think about that basically they still have a developer and that developer is now just an untrained person. You still have to have all that trust. You still have all that cost. It doesn't actually solve the problem as well as it seems. And at the end of the day, the real issue is get a good developer. Once you have that relationship, you're not going to have those problems ongoing. So just get your hiring or your staffing under control. That will fix things naturally. Thanks for joining me. I'll see you next time.